This is Corey Franklin reporting from Chicago with people who died in the news recently who have changed history or changed society. And tonight we're going to start out not with somebody who necessarily changed history, but who has a fascinating story. We're going to start out with Maria Altman. Maria Altman died at the age of 94 recently. Her story is fascinating because it goes back to pre-World War II Vienna. She came from a wealthy family in Vienna in the 19-teens and 1920s. Her parents were friendly with the artist Gustav Klimt. Her uncle commissioned Klimt to do several portraits, including a portrait of his wife, Maria's aunt, and several other portraits of her. The first portrait of Maria's aunt was known as the Golden Adele. Klimt was the leading Austrian artist of the first half of the 20th century, and uh, he worked in oils, and at that time he was doing uh, portraits with a lot of gold in them. And Maria's family got five pictures from Klimt, the most famous being the Golden Adele, a second picture of her aunt, and three others. Here is Maria describing the room that her family kept the Klimt's in in their home in Vienna. My mother was the sister of Adele, you know, the gold part. Um, so I grew up with the paintings because uh, though Adele died very young, my uncle had made like a memorial room where there were just the clean paintings and flowers all year round. Maria's mother had died in the 20s and had hoped that the paintings could go on display in Austria, but when her father died after the war, he willed them to the Altman family. In any event, the Nazis seized the paintings, and after the war, they were taken by the Austrian government and put on display in Austria. As I said, Maria's father died in 1945, and she had moved from England to Los Angeles. It wasn't until Maria Altman was 85 years old that she decided to make a claim for the painting. She contacted Randall Schoenberg, who was also Austrian. He was the grandson of Arnold Schoenberg, the famous Austrian composer, and he was also a part of Viennese society at the time, knew uh, Maria's family. Randall was a lawyer who took interest in Maria's case, and I'm going to let him tell what happened when 85-year-old Maria Altman tried to get her climps back from the Austrian government. In 1998, Austria passed a new law that was designed to return looted artworks, and at that point, Maria called me up and asked for my assistance. And that's when I became involved as we tried to navigate through that new Austrian law. She showed me the documents, and we combined those with documents that had been dug up by a wonderful journalist named Hubertus Chernin. It painted, I thought, a compelling picture for return of the artworks under the new Austrian law. But, it, of course, it took us about eight years to convince the Austrians of that. After the war, the Austrians claimed that the paintings had not really been looted from Ferdinand, but rather that they had previously been donated and promised to the museum by Ferdinand's wife, Adela. So Maria understood that to be the case. It turned out not to be true. So the Austrian government was essentially trying to put one over on the elderly Maria Altman, but time turned out to be on her side. It wasn't until 2004 when we went in the Supreme Court that we were really allowed to start the case. And uh, at that time, she was already 88 years old. So uh, it was really a very long, long, hard-fought battle. I think for both of us coming from, you know, because my family is the same background as hers, for both of us, the motivation was to tell the story and make sure that the, the truth about what transpired in Austria with her family and my family and all the Jewish families in Austria was told to people. Uh, obviously, we wanted to recover the paintings, but we always knew that that was a real long shot, and we thought, well, if along the way we can at least tell the story, that's got to be a worthwhile thing. Uh, the real breakthrough came when Austria agreed to do an arbitration and take the case out of court in the United States. And so we went to arbitration, and in January 2006, those three arbitrators ruled in our favor on the core legal question in the case, which was, did Adele Blochbauer give these paintings to the museum in the 1920s or not? They said no and needed to be returned under Austria's new art restitution law. Here is the BBC announcement of that verdict in favor of Maria Alp. A court in Austria has ruled that five paintings by the Austrian artist Gustav Klimt are the property of an 89-year-old woman in California 
who's argued for seven years that the works were looted from her family home in Vienna by the Nazis. It, it, was, it was an amazing day. I, I remember going over to Maria's house and uh, celebrating with her and her family. And uh, she had always this great charm and wit and, and said, oh, she always knew that we would win. And I said, uh, well, I wasn't so sure. But uh, she had that type of confidence and character that made it just a pleasure to work with her on this great case. The paintings were then brought first to Los Angeles for a big exhibit at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So that was really a terrific, terrific event where Maria could show her entire family these pictures that she had recovered after, after 60 years. After the paintings were exhibited in Los Angeles, Maria and her family had to decide what to do with them. Well, the heirs had long discussions then in the aftermath of, de of the decision what to do with these five pictures that were so enormously valuable. Uh, you know, they have modest homes, they have modest middle-class lifestyles. Uh, Maria herself was selling dresses out of her home until she was about 85. So it wasn't as if she could hang a uh, $100 million painting in her home. So the question became what to do with them. And collectively, the heirs decided to, to dispose of them, which meant that the gold portrait was sold to the Neue Gallery, a beautiful museum uh, that's based in New York. And the other four pictures, which were less famous, were then sold at auction. I was there. Maria was at the auction with a, a number of members of her family. It was at Christie's in New York and a really very interesting event, I must say. Well, 54, fourth came there, portrait of Adele Blochbauer 2. Again, we three, really uh, did not know how things would play out. And in this case, $25 million starts. It's at 25 But all, all four of the pictures uh, achieved remarkable results. And Stupendo, $58 million. Golden Adele, the one patient that wasn't sold at auction, went for $135 million and was bought by Ronald Lauder, which made it the most expensive painting ever sold. Uh, Maria called it their Mona Lisa. It exceeded the world price record previously held by Picasso by over $30 million. And when that was put together with the auction paintings, the total, needless to say, was quite impressive. If you include the gold portrait, it was, it was over $300 million, yes. It did not really change Maria in any, any way. Uh, it did allow her to have very fine caretakers at the end of her life, which I think was very nice. But Maria, you know, she had grown up in a very wealthy environment in Vienna. And yet she said that she was really raised by her parents not to need any of the normal accoutrements of wealth. So that when everything was taken away from her when she was just 22 years old, she really didn't feel like she had lost much. She was very much a self-sufficient person. So she really didn't change at all. The Golden Adele now hangs in the Neue Gallery in New York. And that's the story of Maria Allman, who died recently, who fought a decades-long battle to win back the Klimt paintings of her family and finally won against all odds. A story to warm your heart. Well, we're going to move from Maria Allman to some American royalty who died recently. The Duke died. The Duke of Flatbush, Edwin Duke Snyder. And Duke Snyder was the center fielder for the Brooklyn Dodgers in the 1950s. He was a hero to Brooklynites. He patrolled center field at Ebbets Field. The 1950s Brooklyn teams are among the most legendary in baseball history. They were immortalized in Roger Kahn's book, The Boys of Summer. They were affectionately known by Brooklynites as the Bums. And Duke Snyder was one of the great players on that team, which included Jackie Robinson. In fact, he broke into the major leagues the same day as Jackie Robinson. Uh, Pee Wee Reese, Carl Erskine, Carl Farillo, Gil Hodges, Roy Campanella, very famous names. Duke Snyder helped the Brooklyn Dodgers win six pennants in the National League in the 1950s. Unfortunately, they only won one World Series against the Yankees before they moved out of Brooklyn to Los Angeles. He was on the Los Angeles Dodgers in 1959 when they won the World Series. But Duke Snyder was one of the great players of the 1950s as a center fielder. He was consistently compared to Willie Mays of the New York Giants and Mickey Mantle of the New York Yankees. Probably was not as good a player as them. He was a great hitter and a great fielder, probably not quite in their league. Nevertheless, Duke Snyder is the answer to the trivia question, which player hit the most home runs in the decade of the 1950s? 
And it was not Willie Mays. It was not Mickey Mantle. It was not any of the other players. It was Duke Snyder. As I said, he was a great fielder, very good hitter. He hit four home runs in the World Series twice, the only player to do that. And in the 1980s, he was elected to the Hall of Fame. Here is a little bit of him talking about his speech at the Hall of Fame. I don't know why, but uh, it's not the biggest thing that happened to me in my baseball career getting in the Hall of Fame. The biggest thing that happened to me was becoming a major league ball player and knowing in my own mind that I belong in the major leagues. That probably more than important than anything else, to know in your own mind that you belong there and that you're good. I mean, that's not cockiness or overconfidence or anything else, but to know you belong and to know that you're good. And I think I, I got a little piece of that from Pee Wee, I had a piece of that from Jackie, I had a piece of that from Gil, I had a piece of that from most of my teammates. I learned a little bit from each one of my room with Carl Erskine, and uh, there's no finer man that ever put on a baseball uniform than Carl Erskine. And I learned a lot from Carl. And I, and I looked out, and Erskine was out there. He wasn't there because he was upset because he hadn't gotten in the Hall of Fame. And I understood why. I mentioned it in my talk. But uh, Buzzy Bavese was there. Pete Rozell was there. There's a lot of friends from Fallbrook were there. A lot of friends from, from Brooklyn, New York City, a lot of Dodger fans. A lot of my friends from Montreal were there. And it was just it was so satisfying to know that they had come there to help me celebrate getting into the Hall of Fame. But still... At the end of my comments, I just thank God for making me a Brooklyn and Los Angeles done. Duke Snyder will never be forgotten in Brooklyn or in baseball circles for the way he played and uh, the type of player he was. Late in his life, he was involved in one of the baseball memorabilia scandals where some of the players were taking money for autographs and weren't declaring to the IRS. And he was financially penalized, but he was quite contrite about it, and the fans seemed to forgive him. And he became an elder statesman in baseball. He was always very, very grateful to the fans in Brooklyn and later to the fans in Los Angeles when the Dodgers moved to Los Angeles. And his name will always be one of the names synonymous with the great Brooklyn Dodgers of the 1950s. And with the golden age of center field in New York, along with Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle. So baseball fans everywhere say goodbye to one of the great center fielders from New York in the 1950s, the Duke of Flatbush, Duke Snyder. Well, there's no other way to close tonight but the obvious. That is the great song by Terry Cashman celebrating the three great center fielders from New York, Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle, and the Duke. There are a lot of great 50s references in here, both baseball and non-baseball, and I urge younger listeners to Google them so you understand what they're talking about. I will point out we've done two of the people mentioned in this song in our broadcast in recent weeks. Bobby Thompson, he of the famous home run. That was incidentally against Duke Snyder's Brooklyn Dodgers off his friend Ralph Branca. And our other subject was Bob Feller, he of the Van Meter Heater, the great fastballer for the Cleveland Indians. Thanks to my producer, Sid Tepps. I'll see you next week. The Wiz Kids had won it. Bobby Thompson had done it. And Yogi read the comics all the while. Rock and roll was being born. Marijuana we would scorn. So down on the corner, the national pastime went on trial. We're talking baseball. Klazuski, Campanella, talking baseball. The man and Bobby Fella, the scooter, the barber, and the nuke. They knew them all from Boston to Dubuque. Especially Willie, Mickey, and the Duke. Well, KC was winning, Hank Aaron was beginning. One Robbie going out, one coming in. Kiner and Midget Goodell, the Thumper and Mel Parnell, and Ike was the only one winning down in Washington. I'm talking baseball, Lazuski Campanella, talking baseball, the man and Bobby Teller, the Scooter, the Barber, and the Duke. They know them all from Boston to Dubuque, especially Willie, Mickey, and the Duke.